and we spent about an hour to an hour and a half packing um, for Pakistan for two schools. We were, were serving um, our churches, packing for Highland Park and Garden City. But um, it's a pleasant day, a pleasant thing to do. That will be happening uh, this month in July. Thank you very Every much. Wednesday. Every yeah. Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. <laughs> Any other announcements? I want to take this opportunity as a point of personal privilege to share with you about our daughter Kirsten, whom we've been asking you this past year to be praying for. Uh, we spent this last week in Ohio getting her moved into her new home, um, and she's becoming very comfortable there. And uh, the uh, process of working with her attorney and our son-in-law's attorney is coming to what we think is a reasonable conclusion here fairly soon. So thank you for your prayers. We really appreciate that. Um, and you can continue to keep Kirsten in your prayers if you would. It's just as she kind of gets settled in and kind of begins a new chapter of her life. I've been referring to her as my sing our single daughter. Again. Thank you. Other, other praises, other words of thanksgiving, concerns? Yeah, I'd just like to mention that uh, probably most of you know my daughter-in-law recently passed and uh, this past couple, and it's been a, a real journey, an emotional journey for not only me, but my son and my uh, granddaughters. Uh, the response from Franklin, of Rick Church, in Franklin County was just overwhelming. Uh, if it's any sense that community can undergird and uplift people in times of need. To me, that was just an example of it. And it was just a while of the passing, it's tragedy, and we all recognize the, the um, adjustments that have to be made in our family in the future, but still just to have that uh, undergirding support and love that was exhibited to us and my son's family was just overwhelming. Thank and I'm you, grateful for that. We acknowledge that loss and we continue to pray for your son, your granddaughters, and all your family. I'm going to tag right in on that. Um, I've been so touched, particularly this last week, by people's generosity. And you mentioned community and the sense of community and the way we have seen people um, create community for our daughter and their generosity in um, helping her with furnishings and whatnot. Um, I just praise God for all of that. And it, I think it helped to drive home to me the vital importance of community, and especially at this time when, you know, some days it's really hard to feel. Starting to 5735. So I'm great. Midwest on Church Avenue. <laughs> um, I would just ask that people remember Nancy, my sister, she is in Maryland and she's taken a couple weeks of uh, family leave to care for her uh, youngest son who's seriously ill. Anyone else? I invite us to stand in body and body. Oh, Maryland, please. Yeah. 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 Uh, as many of you know, my daughter. Megan turned 40 years old on Monday, and we just had tremendous support to the people. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine she's 40 years old, but in quite a 40 years it's been. But it just, it's just, it's joyful to be able to celebrate some of these things and know that you're not alone in sharing that joy. So. Thank you. Please stand if you're able to body your spirit. Join me in our response to call for worship. We will follow with a unison open prayer and follow by as we say. We, we, we gather to be reminded of what God hopes for in our lives. Give, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand. We gather to consider how our lives can bring good news to our world. As we serve others, may our hearts be filled with joy. 
Let's pray together. God of healing, we come to you often with prayers for others who we love, prayers for wisdom, prayers for the restoration of health, prayers for justice, prayers for strength, prayers for amends to disagreements, prayers for peace. Today, hear our prayers of thanksgiving for all that has been good and inspiring in our lives this week, even during times that seem difficult. Thank you for joy in the morning, contentment in the morning, and hope in the evening. We give you thanks for all the joy that your love brings to us each day. Amen. My Jesus, I love thee, number 522. <laughs> Service 
with uh, joyful things in mind. And so I'd invite you to join me in prayer as I offer a pastoral prayer. I'm going to pause in the middle of this prayer for a time of silence. And during that time, I would encourage you to be in silent prayer for the joys that you've experienced recently. Let us pray. Creator God, this morning we give deep thanks for the beauty of this area in which we live. You have given us the kind of climate that allows flowers and trees to grow in glory this time of year. We thank you for the generous rivers and creeks that flow through the valleys and for the mountains in all their splendor. We have been blessed beyond anything we could have imagined for ourselves had you not placed us within this lush region of your world. But our joys go beyond what we see outside. Here in this amazingly beautiful sanctuary where we come to worship each week, we're inspired not only by what we see, but by who we meet here as our friends in Christ. We've been given a pastor whose wisdom, faith, and dedication to reaching out to all our community is inspiring. You know, O oh God, that we are a group who loves the music of your people, and so we offer our gratitude for our choir, our organist, and our pianist, whose music lifts our hearts in love as we gather here to hear your word and to pause in our busy lives to consider your hopes for those lives. We thank you for the deep joy of being part of this Christian community. We remember those who are not able to be with us in person this morning. Some are away on vacations, and we're grateful for those kinds of trips that at times bring us such happiness. Others are at places in their lives where being here on Sunday morning is difficult, and it warms our hearts to be able to, to connect with them through advances in technology that years ago we never could have imagined. This morning are ones that represent so many good things in our lives because of your love and care, O oh God of all the universe. We know that we are just a small number of those who worship you around the world, but we are very thankful to be among your people who are challenged, inspired, cared for, and loved by you. Keep us strong, O oh God. Help us to spread your good news to each one we meet. Be with us during this time of worship and through the week to come. In your name, with deep gratitude, we offer our prayers. Amen. We'll continue by singing Spirit of Love.
Our scripture for this morning comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of the robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, also passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you for whatever I owe you. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the And the um, expert in law, we'll be reminding ourselves, expert in law said, the one who showed him mercy, Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. In this morning's scripture, we have an expert of law trying to test Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? In my ministry, as well as in my life, I've noticed that when someone we love passes away, the questions of what awaits us in the next life loom really large. I find myself, as I talk to my father, my grandmother, and close friends who moved into their next lives many years ago, wondering where they are what their existence is like in their next life. Perhaps you find yourself doing the same thing. As this scripture moves along, at the end when Jesus asked the expert of the law which character in the story was the true neighbor, the answer given by the one who was questioning Jesus is the one who showed mercy. And Jesus confirms the correctness of that answer. Mercy. If we're made in God's image, as we have been taught, then would it not follow that God would show us mercy? I have always believed that preaching during worship should not simply confirm what we learned as small children about the faith but rather help us to develop a mature adult faith. My topic today falls into that category. Were this 1797 instead of 2011, as the German Baptist brethren, that was our name then, uh, from up and down the East Coast met in Franklin County, Virginia for their annual meeting, if I was one suspected of preaching a belief called universal restoration, I might have found myself on the list of preachers who should be disfellowshipped from the brethren. That's what happened to many brethren in North Carolina where universal restoration and universalism 
were very popular at that time. The questions around universal restoration were hotly debated from 1790 until 1805 at Brethren annual meetings and continued somewhat of a debate all the way to the early 1900s. However, these debates were not the end of universal restoration beliefs in the Church of the Brethren. One result of the annual meeting in Franklin County and the annual meetings right before and after that was that many brethren who believed strongly in universal restoration moved west, where they became known as the Far Western Brethren. They openly preached universal restoration in Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, and later in Illinois, and all the way to Oregon and California. So what is this belief? called Universal Restoration that caused such a stir among the early brethren and continues to be a controversy today. Universal Restoration is the belief that in the end our God of great love, love with a capital L, great big love, will gather all people together in God's big arms in the next slide. Let me repeat that. Universal restoration is the belief that in the end, our God of great love will gather all people together in God's big arms in the next life. This isn't a new idea. Origin of Alexandria of Egypt, born in the year 185 A.D., was the most important theologian and biblical scholar in the early Christian church. At the time Origen lived, Alexandria was the center of learning and intellectual discourse in the ancient Mediterranean world. And it was the theological center of Christianity before the Roman Empire took over. Origen was convinced, and I'm quoting from him, all human souls will ultimately be saved and origin and, and excuse me and united to god forever in loving contemplation and that this is an indispensable part of the of the end promised by paul in first corinthians 15 where in verse 22 it says for as all die in adam so too will all be made alive in Christ. A few verses later in that same chapter, Paul's talking about the end of time and says, when all things are subjected to God, when the Son Jesus will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, and here's the important phrase, so that God may be all in all. From the beginning, brethren believed, and we still do today, that while we are not all of one mind, we should continue to love one another. From the beginning, the brethren also believed in universal restoration. Alexander Mack, our first leader, believed. Conrad Beisel, who was rebaptized in order to give his baptism back to the brethren and went on to found the famous effort of Cloister, believed in universal restoration. We know that the early brethren spent a lot of time studying the Bible. They tried together to become believers who faithfully followed God's word. It's quite possible that the script scriptures that influenced origin also influenced the early brethren. Now here's a confession from me. It's up a little higher. Um, I cringe every time I hear someone say when they're asked what brethren believe, the response is, well, we're kind of like the Mennonites. We are very different than the Mennonites. And since I did half my work at Eastern Mennonite Seminary in Harrisonburg, Virginia, before our family packed up and moved to the suburbs of Chicago so I could study at Bethany, our, our brethren seminary, I might be 
in a better position to recognize the differences between the brethren and the Mennonites than those people are. One very basic difference is the Mennonites are pure Anabaptists. They have this set of beliefs we call Anabaptism. We brethren, as we began in Europe, felt the Anabaptists had some good ideas. And so did another way of believing, which is called pietism. So you have Anabaptism and pietism, two very different ways of believing. The pietists believe in a heartfelt faith, one that is filled with love. So as we brethren are inclined to do, we recognize that we all experience faith differently. And so we have tried to hold these two very different streams of faith together, Anabaptism and Pietism, trying to mesh them together. Universal Restoration came from our Pietist side of the faith, which is definitely the side that I lean towards. There was a time early on when there were actually more brethren than Mennonites in Pennsylvania, if you can believe that. The early brethren were very good and determined at evangelistic efforts. I can't help but wonder if part of the reason that so many were attracted to the brethren was that we brethren were better at believing and telling the good news about our faith. Who wouldn't like to anticipate that in the next life all would be gathered to God? Well, evidently, there are a lot of people who have trouble with that belief. Surely I must have learned something about universal restoration in seminary, but if I did, I didn't remember a thing about it. It's only as I've been doing research on the early brethren that this, uh, this idea has become very prominent in my mind. I've never preached on universal restoration before. And I'm pulling a number of brethren pastors I know they never have either. However, I have had a couple interesting conversations with friends lately who are not part of the Church of the Brethren. And somehow in those conversations there appeared to be a moment when I might mention universal restoration. And what was their reaction? Always the same. They said, that's exactly what I believe, but I have never heard any church preach on that idea. I can't help but wonder why so many have been content to say God loves all people. We say that all the time. Maybe like you were taught as a child to sing, as I was, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. But somehow we've been willing to accept that our God of love, who loves all people, changes once we die into a God of judgment. Many, many churches and preachers, preachers depend on fear to convince people that they should follow Jesus. What convinced you? I'm asking a, a question that I don't expect you to answer out loud, but what convinced you to follow Jesus? For me, it was the message of an evangelist when I was in fourth grade. He wasn't brethren, but there were a lot of brethren who went to listen to him. He went on and on about Noah and the flood, the night our family went to listen to him. The water was so deep, he said, that even cats who could climb trees would drown because the water was, going to be, was deeper than the trees. I had a cat I loved. I began to listen closer to this pastor's message. Maybe you can swim, he said, but how long do you think you can tread water? 40 days and 40 nights? I was a pretty good swimmer at that point, but I knew I couldn't tread water that long. And when the altar call was given at the end of the sermon, I went forward. I was scared to death. I decided I better get on the right team here. I don't see the use of fear as a good thing in our faith, do you? George Whitfield in England, one of the founders of Methodism, wrote to John Wesley and then 
that Peter Boner, a bishop in the Moravian Church, had privately confessed in a letter that, and I quote, all the damned souls that would hereafter be brought out of hell. All those souls would be brought out of hell. Moravians and Methodists, Lutherans and Reformed, Baptists, all are pietists. And yet how have we gotten to the point where universal restoration has been set aside? Rather than share the good news, we have instead, in many ways, been content to share the bad news. You better do this, or you better not do that if you want to get to heaven. What do we, what do you, think happens to us after we die? Is our teaching on the afterlife good news or bad news? Have we replaced the love of God with the fear of God in order to try to twist people into belief in Christianity? Brethren at their best have believed in a God of love, not a God of fear. And that, my friends, is the basis of the belief of the universal restoration. Universal restoration is one more belief that is based on our basic nature about God. Is God, I ask again, a God of love? Or is God a God of judgment? Well, many Christians believe God is both. We brethren in the past have believed that love is the stronger force of God in this world. But you might ask yourself, if in the end all people will be saved and welcomed by God into eternal life, doesn't that mean that what we do here on this earth means nothing? What do you have when you take the fear out of faith? Many Christians, including many brethren, operate on a fear-based religion. But that hasn't always been the case and doesn't, and doesn't have to be the case today, in my opinion. I think it's time we assess who we are and what we believe in order to reduce fear and judgment and bring in more love. Why are so many young people not part of the church? Brother Harry asked us last week in his sermon. I think at least part of the reason is that the church has the reputation of being judgmental about issues that many young people have no problem accepting. We often appear to be critical of certain people rather than loving them. So if all are saved in the end, doesn't that mean that they will pay no attention to what they do in their life here on earth? Writer James Bolton in 1793, when all this was going on about universal restoration, mentions the brethren in a pamphlet with the goal of proving that universal restoration does not lead to a lack of moral lives. He wrote, Those people who believe in universal restoration live stricter than those who don't in general. The German Baptists, that's us, all believe it. All believe it, he says. Yet no people live stricter or more moral than they do, and many hundreds beside them. Yet it doesn't tend to make them licentious. Alexander Mack, the first leader of our faith, believed in universal restoration. But he felt it was a concept that should be shared only with mature Christians. I've read others who have held similar beliefs. It's okay to believe it, but don't preach it, some say. Since when does the love of God become a don't ask, don't tell belief? <laughs> and yet the brethren were extremely successful evangelizers in their early days in our country. Might that not be because they share the joy of their belief in universal restoration? 
Universal restoration continues to be a controversial belief. And when I um, gathered my things to come to church this morning, there were three books I was going to bring with me, and I don't have it, so I'm going to pretend I have it. Um, I remember a small book, it was actually an essay, I'm going to bring a copy, you've probably seen it, written by Frank Ramirez on Universal Restoration. It was published by Brethren Press in 2001 for use in churches. It created quite a stir. I was fortunate enough to be Frank's neighboring pastor in Pennsylvania. Frank is quite prolific. I don't think the man sleeps with all that he writes. And he's a brilliant author in my opinion. He wrote an incredible book on the love feast. I was going to bring that one too that I recommend that everybody take a look at and read sometime. Some of us get to read his thoughts often since he's part of the ecumenical team that creates the Wired Word, which our adult Sunday school class reads. In this essay that Frank wrote, published by Brethren Press, he says, one of the things that struck me the first time I read the Bible from cover to cover is that justice, not salvation, is the major issue presented consistently from the Torah, the prophets, and the writings through the entire New Testament. Justice, not salvation. God's protective justice is evident in the story of Eden, Frank says, the murder of Abel, and the intervention at the Tower of Babel. The law revealed to Moses is designed to ensure justice, not only for God's people, but for strangers, widows, and orphans, and all on the margin of society. Frank goes on to say, if justice and mercy, mercy is that word that the, the man testing Jesus answered with, if justice and mercy are at the heart and soul of the Bible, is it justice to sentence someone to eternal and horrific punishment for crimes committed within a finite time, regardless of how horrible the crime? I heard Pastor Pam Rice preach on universal restoration at the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren recently. She asked a question that I think we should all ask ourselves. She asked, what if salvation is not about what happens when we die, but what happens when we begin to realize how much God loves us right now? Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that question. What if salvation is not about what happens after we die, but what, ha what begins when we realize how much God loves us now? Amen. Years ago, Roger Schrock, whose name might be familiar to some of you, he was a, and ha continues to be a strong leader in the Church of the Brethren, recommended a book to me, and that's the third book I was going to bring this morning. It's called If Grace is True. Why God Will Save Every Person, If Grace is True. It's a fascinating book. Uh, it's written by two Quakers, Philip Gully and James Mahala. If the ideas that I mentioned this morning in the sermon interest you, I would suggest that either Frank Ramirez's uh, essay on universal restoration or If Grace is True might be good ways to learn some more. What if we do believe that God not, God not only loves every person in the world, but God loves them for all eternity? God not only loves us here, sitting at Central Church of the Brethren in this minute, but loves every one of us for all eternity. That belief can change how we see people that we meet every day. To extend God's love beyond our lives forever. And the breadth and the depth of God's love when we do that becomes even larger. I was taught to say deep and wide, you know that, deep and wide. I think as we seek to be a peace church, and a church that would like to see all people honored and loved, universal restoration is a belief worth considering. Not to keep secret, but to share with everyone we meet. Amen.
And with them leading us, we're going now to sing Don't Be Afraid. It's, uh, it's on a insert in your
benediction, never imagining we'd have no light in the sanctuary this morning, but sometimes we are light by serving, sometimes by seeing another's light. But God's call is to all of us, whoever we are, whatever our station in life, to be lights to the nation. Shine on, brothers and sisters, as you go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 